I would rather have the crazy Lauren Boebert who believes those things saying them. Because ultimately, like, don't you want people saying the things they believe to be true rather than people who are lying to oh. voters and saying things that they only think that the voters you, demand You would to rather hear? have Lauren Boebert? I mean, look. Uh, she believes it. Yeah, but like believing things. she believes it. Believing things is overrated when what you're believing is nuts. Hello, everyone. This is JVL here with my best friend, Tim Miller, and sitting in for my other best friend is Will Salatan. Boys, we had some elections. Uh, I thought that was just, I thought Sarah just had a rough time camping. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Will is Isn't wearing Sarah fingerless camping? gloves. Uh, so we just, we just had uh, some, some voting last night, and it was a mixed bag. The squad took it on the chin which is great. And uh, the Trump MAGA endorsees kind of took it on the chin a little bit. I, Tim, you wrote about this this morning for Morning Shots, uh, our excellent newsletter product, which everybody should sign up for. Ding, ding, ding. Uh, let me put a cord in the machine. What's going on? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, there, there are kind of two stories of last night. So, I, the you know, the main one, these elections, it's always like, oh, uh, you know, you want a clean story where it's like every every crazy Republican one and every normal Democrat one. And it's like, if you write anything, then somebody's like, well, actually, did you notice what happened in the Utah CD3? And it's like, <laughs> okay, like at the, at the broadest strokes, I think there's one important lesson that we learned, which is among incumbent candidates uh, so who are being primaried, on the Democratic side, uh, you are at risk of being primaried if you act too crazy or too extreme. We saw that in New York with Jamal Bowman, um, who gets primaried by George Latimer, who is, uh, to be frank, too conservative probably for the district. And he's not he's not moderate in the sense that Joe Mo Biden is moderate. He's like moderate almost into Joe Manchin territory. Maybe not all the way to Joe Manchin, but uh, closer to Manchin than Biden. And so Latimer wins his primary in a liberal district in New York because Democratic voters are like, look, this guy doing 9-11 conspiracies, saying Hamas didn't really rape anybody after October 7th. It's too – pulling the fire alarm. It's too far. It's too crazy. We're going to go with the other person. There's also, I think, a little bit of a story of, again, the high propensity college-educated Dems. I think really, you know, white Dems and Jewish Dems really turned out to defeat Bowman. So that you have that with Bowman. But you have a similar story in Colorado. Polis was talking to me, to me about this, Governor Polis, on the ride between – I went to an event with him before I did the interview, and we were discussing this on the ride. He's like, I want you to keep an eye out on these two House districts where they have, like, a little mini Colorado squad where there are these two people who, like, one likens herself to Cori Bush, the other other is a rose emoji socialist. Uh, both of them were, let's just say, Hamas sympathetic in some of their rhetoric um, and, and offensive to one of the Jewish Democrats in the, in the uh, legislature. Um, both of them get primaried. Both of them lose. So we have a couple of examples of Democrats going too crazy, losing their primaries. On the Republican side, among incumbents, again, we're just talking incumbents, Lauren Boebert, leaves her district, carpetbags to a totally different district after, um, you know, kind of cr doing a little crank yankers inside <laughs> Beetleju Beetlejuice the Musical and like, and vaping. And she wins handily. So uh, I'm sorry, did you just primary. say handily? I just want to be clear. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice flag. And then again, it, it, going down to the state legislative level in South Carolina, three women, uh, Republicans, who who spoke out against the draconian abortion bill? Now, I, I, they, they aren't, these aren't pro-choice Republicans. These aren't even Susan Collins. These they're, they're conservative Republicans who wanted like a fifty. I, I forget. I think it was a fifteen week or some more reasonable abortion restriction. All three of them lose their primaries to more hard right candidates. So, um, as you mentioned. Some of the Trump crazies lost primaries and some open primaries, and, and Utah in particular, a couple normie Republicans won, and that's great. I, 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 I'm hoping for a mixed bag story. But, but the, among incumbents, you're only at threat in the Republican Party if you act too moderate, too normal, too critical of Trump. On the Democratic side, you're only at threat as an incumbent if you act too crazy, too extreme. Uh, that is, that's an important distinction, 
and, and and it creates incentives that explain a lot of our politician behavior in both parties over the last few years. And and so I like that to me is the key distinction. There, there's some other things you could talk about uh, that that complicate the picture a little bit, but but it's pretty cut and dry when it comes to the incumbent incentive model. Will. Uh, so, so I, first of all, I love the, I love the mixed bag. I love, my, my, you know, my big theory about the world. Of course is all, you do. It's so on brand for you. <laughs> yeah, it is. All the big, th- my big theory is all the big theories are false, right? Like if things are always more complicated. So I kind of love that we're forced to like grapple with the, the reality of this. I also love what, what you're pointing out, Tim, about the problem solvers versus ideologues thing. So in the Democratic Party, the Bowman case, is a, that's a really good illustration that in at least in the Democratic Party, it's still a governing party. It's a party that cares about getting stuff done. And I would I really hope that the lesson of the Bowman uh, uh, defeat is not that sort of the, the, you know, I hope it's not about issue position so much it is it's about doing a job. You're, you're a congressman, you got a job. And he was a grandstand, Bowman's a grandstander, and he just wasn't doing the job. And everything that people in the district said is like, yeah, there's all this stuff. He's, you know, he's talking about Gaza, but he's not talking about here, which was how Bowman got elected in the first place. Like Elliot Engel, you know, like Mr. Foreign Affairs, not paying attention to the district. So I would like to believe. But it's, and, and yeah, just to like put a finer point on this, AOC is right there across the borough from him, and she didn't get primaried. And this is true. Like, it w- really wasn't a policy thing. It was about his crazy behavior, and also uh, he didn't even vote for the infrastructure bill. You know what I mean? Like, he wasn't helpful to the Democrats, and he acted crazy, and he was extreme, right? right. And so it wasn't so much just about, like, you're too progressive. It's like this other stuff. Yeah, and, and the infrastructure thing is really interesting because I wasn't following the race closely, but my understanding is – so the, the left's portrayal is APAC bought the race. APAC, you know, they made it like the Israel and they took us down for all this stuff. And it turns out like some of the APAC ads were really about like the in, him voting against infrastructure. Like APAC yeah. was putting the money, but it wasn't really about Israel. So basic things like voting against infrastructure, the most problem solving of problem solving issues was infrastructure, yeah, right? right? <laughs> and he, he, so he, he was against that. Um, the other, the other question I want to raise though is, is there any hope in these results that a problem solving also does matter on the Republican side. And Tim, I, I know you've just made the case the other way, but Lauren Boebert had to retreat. She basically fled from a district where she nearly lost last time because she was too right wing. And she had to move over to another district that's like more red, right? That I've got bad news for you, Will. <laughs> okay, give me your bad news. I mean, it's good news and bad news, I guess. I, I, well... Uh, you know, again, I'm happy to say it's more complicated, particularly in certain areas. Like there, and there are some examples last night, particularly in Utah. Sarah did a great focus group with with uh, podcast with McKay Coppins about how Utah is different. The more the Mormons are just acting a little more responsibly than the evangelicals. Let's just put it that I'm not I'm not here to start a religious war, okay, or a new crusade, but like just objectively on the merits, the Mormons are acting a little more responsibly. And so th- there are some examples of areas where Republicans did go with a more problem-solving candidate. So I don't want to dismiss that completely. The Boebert example is not that. Boebert left the third district and moved to the fourth to flee the general election candidates, the, or, or the general election voters, the the swing voters, the Haley Republicans that were going to feed it, that were going to give it to her in the general election and elect Adam Frisch, friend of the pod, in CD3. And instead she moved over to CD4, which is a far-right district where there's no, no, nobody's going to hold her rep- accountable because it's all MAGA Republicans to vote over there. So I, I don't think the Boebert story is one of Republican voters wanting problem solving. It's it's a Boebert fleeing normal voters to find Republican voters who don't want problem solving. <laughs> okay, just going just gonna to do pull one pony You're bringing the pony out? Just You're bringing the bringing pony out? I'm bringing out a pony on this. I, I, okay. I hear you, and you're right about the particular point about the Republican primary. But it is still it is still good that there was a general election threat that forced Republicans to nominate a more moderate, more problem solving candidate than Lauren Boebert, right? And sure. was it Jeff Hurd who who won that the primary? Hurd, Jeff. Yeah, Hurd, yeah, right. And so that was again the the Democrats wanted the crazy, and they didn't get that person. They got a moderate Republican nominated in that district because that's the only kind of Republican. Well, not because, but that's the only one who, who could win in that in the third district, right? So that it's still it is good if there are incentives in the general election that prod the Republican Party to be more moderate and 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 practical, pragmatic, than to nominate someone like Lauren Boebert. Correct? I mean, maybe I you know. So the Jeff Hurd thing, I really wonder about because. <laughs> 
Look, I don't want to force purity tests on anybody, but uh, a guy who isn't willing to say whether or not he voted for Trump is like the worst of both worlds, right? I mean, it you because the, the reason we want moderates because we want somebody the classic who will, JVL. Right, JVL's so, like, give me Lauren Boebert, <laughs> give me of. the knob schlobbing inside the vaping inside the musical because over she somebody who it won't tell me the truth. She'll, who, who she'll won't tell say me who what they she are. actually thinks about these things versus Heard, and Heard's position is like. uh don't worry, I'll stand up to the bad guys because I'm made of really stern stuff. Oh, but I won't tell you who I voted for because I don't want you to be mad at me. Like, what? I don't understand. Like, what, what's the point of running for office? And I mean this honestly. What is the point of running for office if you are too afraid to tell your constituents the truth about who you fucking voted for for president? When it's the single most important issue. I don't. And so, I, look, will this guy be better if he if he beats fresh? Will he be better in office than Lauren Boebert? Honestly, I don't know. I mean, you know, he'll present better. He'll be able to go on, you know, cable news and not be frothing at the mouth. Probably. But if there's another impeachment, you know, would you trust him to buck the party and get... <laughs> <laughs> no effing way. No I mean, effing way. Am I wrong? He'll, he'll vote better. And he, so to the problem solving uh, part of this, a guy like Heard, I, oh, we're getting really nerdy for the listeners who like, don't know who any of these characters are, but but you know the type, right? A, a guy like Heard, who is a Republican who knows better, who ends up winning this primary in Bober's told district, um, he will vote the right way on the secret Congress stuff. Right. On the infrastructure bill, on the CHIPS Act, right? Like the types of things that like are not hot button things. Right. And so I guess that's better in a problem solving way to have somebody like that than Bobert, who, you know, is going to just like be an anarchist uh, in there. Um, but I is hear it, you, though. It's fr it's flummoxing. Is it better? It's hard to it's hard to get. It's, you don't want to hand it to him. I don't want to hand it to him. Will wants to hand it to him, which is fine. But I know these guys. So I'm projecting my loathing of all the Jeff Herds in my life onto this man who I don't know at all. And so, you know, Will doesn't have that that problem. So he can be maybe a little more clear eyed. No, the, I, I mean, I'm I don't definitely want to be not. an accelerationist because I don't I think the accelerationists are generally wrong, like in, in every context. I just mean, like, as a pure, like, well, what's the difference? Right. I mean, you know, he's going to on all the important stuff. He'll vote the same way that Bobert would. And so, like, why? Why is why do we think he's better? I don't know. Do you think he's going to vote the same way as Bobert? First of all, do we can we agree that I won't say who I voted for is kind of going to be read as and maybe is just code for I didn't vote for Trump. Like if you voted for Trump, why wouldn't you say that? In a Republican the guy primary. didn't vote for Trump and look good on him. Right. But if, again, if you don't have the courage to say that to the people you're asking to vote for you, then why the fuck are you running for office in the first place? Like, go be an anonymous commenter on the Internet, because that's your level of courage. <laughs> you know, it, one, one of the funniest things to me about being at the Bulwark is I come in from the sort of a, the left side, center left side, and, I, you know, like other people of my persuasion, I look at some of these moderate, what I think of as moderate Republicans or whatever passes for moderate Republicans. And I'm constantly looking for signs that, oh, this guy, this guy we can work with. This guy has some good instincts. He at least isn't, didn't vote for Trump. And you guys come, coming from the conservative, the Republican side are just like, oh, I know these people. <laughs> this, this guy's a weasel. Don't trust them. I work with. It's really kind of disconcerting to hear that. But I feel like I am not the wiser head here. You guys are. You know, it's funny, the opposite I was saying. Is, so in the uh, in the convo I was referencing earlier with, with Governor Polis when we were like driving between events, um, I, I, he was in the will role in the car, you know, because <laughs> I was asking him about all my old Republican friends who don't talk to me anymore. Like there was this guy who was a congressman named Scott McGinnis who I, I had supported who like turned to MAGA and, and we talked about some other people like that. And I was like, 
what's the deal with them? They've all gone so crazy. And he's like, I don't know. I talked to them. They're like, yeah, okay. I'm like, but they went for Trump. And he's like, well, yeah, they all have to go for Trump. I don't know. I don't judge it because of that. And I was like, okay. And then he's like, but you know who's really bothering me is these two DSA guys in the house that were blocking my agenda. <laughs> and so there, there is something about the narcissism of small differences or the, the closer, you know, like uh, the family feud element to this thing where, where yeah, you have me, a little bit more animus let me, let me for put the it this people way. on your own side. Let me put it this way. So I, you know, I, I, I do have the ability to see the future. And in the future, Jeff Hurd is going to be running around his district talking about how uh, Joe Biden's America is terrible and crime is out of control and inflation is out of control and things look have you how been to awful downtown it is. Grand Junction lately. <laughs> the woke DAs and the woke DAs in the mountain counties. And, and Oops. you know what? I, I, I would. <laughs> He doesn't believe any of that because he knows it's not true. And I would rather have the crazy Lauren Boebert who believes those things saying them. Because ultimately, like, don't you want people saying the things they believe to be true rather than people who are lying to no. voters and saying things that they only think that the voters You, you would to rather hear? have Lauren Boebert? I mean, look. Uh, she believes it. Yeah, but like believing she things, believes it. Believing things is overrated when what you're believing is nuts. Look, <laughs> look. is it worse though? Yeah, is it worse than saying things you don't believe you're, and lying to JBL, voters. It is not the saying whether or not you voted for Trump is not the most important thing about being in Congress. Right, right now we have a Congress that's on a razor's edge. The most important thing is actually doing the job, passing basic bills like funding the government. Like that's that's the more basic thing. And and honestly, if Heard wants to go around saying Joe Biden caused all these problems. That is standard Republican rhetoric now. I don't, I don't begrudge him that he's wrong, but I don't, it's not going to threaten but the government. But he's wrong and he knows it. Uh, Lauren Boebert, like taking down speakers or, um, you know, re 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 uh, single handedly not failing to supply the one or two votes needed to pass some basic funding bill. That is a much bigger problem than any of the rhetoric. Is it a problem? I don't know. I think it was it was good that she did those. We had things. The, the house paralyzed she, for three weeks because they couldn't figure yeah. out a speaker. But she showed America what the Republican Party is. Wait, you Isn't are an accelerationist. Service? Isn't that a much bigger service? <laughs> Maybe I'm an accelerationist. <laughs> Will, isn't it true that we have to burn the entire thing to the ground first? <laughs> This Tim, do you have a best, message from our sponsor? This is the best. That was the best podcast segment ever about the Colorado Third District Republican <laughs> primary. I mean, don't let, ever let anybody tell you that you cannot do an entire twenty-minute podcast segment about three House District primaries. The people want more. Okay, oh, next week we're going to do electric. Arizona Six. <laughs> you won't, you, won't, you have, I have so many fucking thoughts about Arizona Six. You guys have no idea. Okay, um, this episode is sponsored by Lumen. The world's first handheld, not intentional, metabolic coach. Lumen is a device that measures your metabolism through your breath, and on the app, it lets you know if you're burning fat or carbs and gives you tailored guidance to improve your nutrition, workout, sleep, and even stress management. Here's how it works. You breathe into your Lumen first thing in the morning, and you'll know what's going on with your metabolism, whether you're burning mostly fats or carbs. Then Lumen gives you a personalized nutrition plan for that day based on your measurements. You can also breathe into it before and after workouts and meals so you know exactly what's going on in your body in real time. And Lumen will give you tips to keep you on top of your health game. Metabolism is at the center of everything your body does. Optimal metabolic health translates to a bunch of benefits, including easier weight management, improved energy levels, better fitness results, and better sleep. Um, you know, I've been out here podcasting, uh, but my husband is out there doing CrossFit every day while I'm in my parents' basement, and uh, he's using his Lumen uh, before uh, he goes to the gym, and it's been incredibly helpful in informing uh, what he should be eating beforehand or after, what kind of protein shake he's, he's going for. If you're someone who wants to keep better track of what your body needs at any given moment, I recommend you give Lumen a try. So if you want to take the next step in improving your health, go to lumen.me slash the next level to get 15% off your Lumen. That's L-U-M-E-N dot me slash the next level for 15% off your purchase. Thank you, Lumen, for sponsoring this episode. So uh, I guess we got to do this debate tomorrow. It's great. Super excited about it. Uh, I, I, I had like an extended rant with AB yesterday that I'm going to turn into a newsletter tomorrow about what CNN should do, um, and obviously won't do because, you know, everybody believes that they're 
their duty is to some bizarre abstract code of journalistic ethics and not to serving their audience and presenting the truth. Um, Will, so Tim and I have talked a little bit about debate stuff. I haven't heard anything from you. What are, what are your going into this? What are your thoughts on debate world? Uh, JVL, I would love to be the optimist here, but um, it's kind of been beaten out of me at the presidential race level. Um, the, the, we're talking about a race where, you know, one of the candidates just got convicted of 34 felonies. And I believe at most it moved the race two points at most and did not tip it. So you got to figure that the effect of the debate is going to be less than two points. Probably zero. I don't, I, I don't know. First of all, there won't be anything said that's going to change anybody's mind because Trump's already said anything that would change anybody's mind. Um, there's not going to be an event in the debate that's bigger than a conviction. Um, the one thing that might make a difference is can Joe Biden look like an alpha? So even though I don't think anything will be said that matters, if for 90 minutes or most of it, Biden can look like he's got it together not, you know, weak and shuffling, strong, a strong voice going after Trump. You know, when Biden gets angry, he can do that in short bursts. I don't know if he can do it for 90 minutes. But I think the only thing that will matter is, will some people who haven't been paying attention to the election watch the debate? And will, during that 90 minutes, Joe Biden convey strength, which I think is the whole ball game at this point. And if he can do that, maybe some of those people decide, okay, He's strong enough to do the job. That's about it. That's all I got for you, man. That's great. We're going to make decisions about the fate of liberal democracy as if we were a tribe of chimpanzees we evaluating are. the strength of the alpha <laughs> male. That's, hmm. that's great. Does Plutok look strong enough to defeat Zarmok? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I guess I shall support him. <sighs> Dr. Zayas. Uh, Tim? Yeah. I've got a thought. Uh, it's the Arizona eighth primary. That oh, so we're going to do next week. On. Good, good. You want to really so tease know. that? I, I don't. <laughs> I don't have. A, I don't have a ton of thoughts on Arizona six. If we have some Arizona listeners who want me to have thoughts on that, you can send me. But it's the eighth. I have a lot of thoughts on. <laughs> um, the um, I got to tell you uh, that Will is right. The Plutog Zarmok thing is right. Here's the best case scenario. Here, but I want to put a positive spin on it. Okay, so. Here's the best possible way to look at the debate and the most optimistic way to look at it from Joe Biden's standpoint is that there is this mystery out there that nobody, despite all Sarah's work in focus groups, that nobody's really explained, which is why are the Democratic Senate candidates polling so much better than Joe Biden? And we know who the people are, right? And and it's a couple groups. It's it's young voters. It's, it's working class black and Hispanic voters. It's Haley Republicans. Like those are the three groups of people that are that are pull that are saying that they're more likely to vote for the Democratic Senate candidate than Biden. Um, all those people just seems very gettable for Biden. For starters, they say they're voting for a Democrat for Senate. <laughs> um, number two, they're demographically aligned with other people in Biden's uh, coalition. Um, and so uh, there is, I think, a hope. I have a hope out there that their real concern is that he seems old. Like they might have other concerns. They don't, the inflation thing is there too, but like all kind of feeds back into the old thing, right? Uh, that it's like, I have this concern about inflation or I have this concern about climate or I have this concern about kids on campus protesting too much or, you know, it's different for these different demographics. And I don't think Joe Biden's strong enough to handle it like blue talk the monkey. And I don't, you know, and I don't think Bi Biden is enough of a leader to, to do it. And so if he demonstrates on a debate stage with Donald Trump that that's not true, that he's got it, then you would think that some percentage of those people that say they're voting for Bob Casey and Donald Trump or Bob Casey and RFK or Bob Casey and no, no answer yet might then start saying they're voting for Bob Casey and Joe Biden. And that's kind of a low hanging fruit thing, right? Like Joe Biden, to get those people, Joe Biden's not, he's not trying to win over a MAGA Republican or somebody that is a two-time Trump voter, though hopefully, you know, he's, we're going to try to win over some of those. That's what our VAT's working on. But um, uh, to me, so to me, I think that is like a glimmer of possible optimism that, you know, might get snuffed out to, <laughs> but uh, uh, to, I look at the debate and, that, and that's kind of like a lower bar for Joe Biden to step over than some of these other things that people are talking about. Yeah. I, uh, 
I, I maintain, I said this last week in Denver, and I, the more I think about it, the more I think I'm right. Um, Mark Caputo had a piece about Trump's debate prep, uh, and... I which think, he's doing, by the way. Which is the, if you didn't read the Caputo it. piece, the important thing is like Caputo, everyone else is out there. Trump's pretending like he's not doing it because he thinks it makes him seem tough. And Caputo's right. reporting is like, no, actually, no, he's he has absolutely six doing sessions. it. And he privately absolutely agreed that uh, the first debate last time was a huge mistake and that it hurt him. This is the thing: like the, Trump is canny, and his lizard brain instincts are quite good, and he knows what he needs to do to serve his own self interest. And he's not, like, so out of control that he can't do what he needs to do to help himself. I, I think he's going to—I listened to him on Newsmax last night being interviewed by Corey Lewandowski, and he was reasonable Trump on Newsmax. He was, you know, just a really statesmanlike and presidential. He was, uh, you know, he was, he was the best version that he can be in terms of presenting to swingy-type voters— and I kind of expect that. And there'll be a lot of litany about all of the murders caused by the filthy vermin immigrants. And, you know, it's the worst inflation that there's ever been. If you elect him, there won't even be any more oil coming out of the ground. And he'll just, you know, talk in that way. You know, it's a disaster. If, uh, you know, China is going to have all the cars, he keeps pushing all these electric cars and he's going to take your gas car away. And then China automatically, all the car car jobs will go to China. And these things, when he says them in his reasonable voice are like, they're wrong and they're crazy, but they just scan as like normal exaggerations, the way a guy at the bar talks. And, uh, I'm pretty worried. Pretty worried um, that Trump is going to just I'm also worried. I want to hear normal. Will's response to that. But I just can we just? I just want to just do this thing. We put a pin in something and say, "Can you remind me?" I want to come back to the Corey Lewandowski Newsmax interview because I have a Newsmax rant. But I want to hear what Will thinks about about calm Trump. So I did not see the Corey Lewandowski thing, JVL. So I I could be persuaded, but I am skeptical that for 90 minutes Trump can hold it together. I mean, so Mark Caputo did this really good. Um, uh, piece looking what, what the what the Trump strategists say he's going to do. Here's the Trump playbook. Here's how we've prepped him to do this. And it's exactly what you said. Be reasonable. Just talk about my record versus Biden's record. That's for all the people who haven't read any of JVL's takedowns of the, the alleged Trump, the alleged great Trump record as president, which is bullshit. But if Trump can focus on that, yeah, it would work. But Trump's never been able to stick to the playbook. So I'm very skeptical that Trump can hold it together for 90 minutes. Biden has clearly been primed to goad Trump, you know, and Trump's so easily goaded. We, we, we know this. So I think Trump is going to lose it at various points in this debate. He's helped by the fact that his mic will get cut off. So his ability to do damage to himself will be, yeah, will be somewhat very limited. He is helped by that. I think that's the fundamental mistake that the Biden team made in the debate. Huh. I, don't, I don't get it. And the, But what's your understanding of the negotiation, that they wanted it or that I don't understand. the Trump people I, wanted it? I, 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 the Trump people want it? I don't know. I mean, if you're, you're saying yeah, it didn't. I, I know. My understanding is that the Biden team wanted it. I don't understand why. Well, maybe, what, here, you know, double bank shot theory here, that you are right that Trump, if he keeps talking, hurts himself. But the Biden people are more worried about Trump simply talking over Biden the way he did to Hillary Dominating Clinton. Him. And being dominated, yeah, looking that that looks worse. I, I think the evidence on that is mixed. You know, Trump didn't, you know... What what was it? Gore walking around, you know, hectoring W didn't look good. So some some yeah. kinds of domination don't look good. But I think when you're dealing with an 81 year old guy, the domination looks good. I think that's I think that's right. Okay. I don't. I've no. This is. I have no insight. Sometimes I talk to Biden people. Every once in a while on this podcast, I'm like, I have a sense that they want to do this because somebody told me. I, I don't. I don't know why they did the mute mic thing. But that that. So that's right. here's the thing. I I believe that the mute mic thing is absolutely the right thing to do. But that also it helps Trump, but not muting it also would have helped Trump in different ways. And that this is the danger whenever you hand a skilled demagogue a microphone. And this is why platforming dangerous people is dangerous. And I, you know, I what I don't understand is if CNN is going to present Donald Trump to its audience and let Trump say, you know, and we got more votes than anybody's ever gotten in the election. And not just grind the entire proceeding to a halt 
and like do chapter and verse on screen about how this isn't true. And if Trump won't concede the point, spend all fucking 90 minutes just on that. Say, Mr. President, Mr. President Biden, you may want to have a seat here. We're going to we're just not going to move on until we we litigate this fully. And Mr. Trump ad admits that he's lying and just sit there and go through like have the whole package. Be prepared to just do 90 minutes on the election with graphics and all that stuff. I just I don't understand a world in which the news media could present a guy like this saying untrue things and be willing to just be like, well, that's not our job. Our, you know, the audience gets to make their own decisions. Our job is just let it all be. Wow. wow, wow, wow. I don't get it. Uh, I want to come back to platforming, but Tim, you wanted to say something. No, 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 please go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll get, uh, go do it. I'll get Newsmax after the break. So, okay, I'll, I'll, I want to just sort of take the other side of the argument about platforming the skilled demagogue. He, he, is, a, he is a demagogue. He is skilled at it. It's his greatest skill. It's like understanding the worst in us and how to tap into it, right? But I, I, I rebel against the idea that, that, that the response to that is to not give him a platform. He is the Republican nominee for president. You got to give him the platform and you don't want to be in the position of being the let, let's not hear from the other side point of view just because he might, you know, sure. Lead and, you and I said you can platform him, okay. but be prepared but, to but, like no. Jonathan Swan did when Jonathan Swan sat for that long White House interview with him. Just have like the, the sheaf of papers right. where you have all the receipts. You just don't let it go. Right. Totally. So so JVL, I thoroughly agree with you on that, that you're talking about what you're talking about is fact checking. Right. And you, I think you've flagged before the Stephanopoulos model, which is perfect. Yeah. Stephanopoulos. I got eight minutes with you. I'm going to ask you about the election fraud. If you lie to me, I'm going to stay with it. I'm going to blow all my other questions off. And make, right, yeah. to totally agree with that. But that is a process of fact checking. The other thing I would say is the solution to a skilled demagogue is not deplatforming. And I'm not going to attribute that to you, but I have heard that from other people. The solution is to have a better messenger opposing the demagogue. And, you know, those of us who have defended Joe Biden all along, we, we got to face up to the fact that we've got a weak messenger and we got we, we got to hope that he holds it together. But we need the media to do their job of interrogating the demagogue. And we need the Democratic messenger to do a better job of making the case against Trump and for his own record. Fair. This podcast is supported by IP Vanish VPN. If you care about the security of your online activity, the easiest way to protect yourself is with IP Vanish. Rated excellent on Trustpilot, IP Vanish provides an encrypted connection for all of your internet traffic, helping to prevent websites, Wi-Fi providers, and hackers from intercepting your data. Help keep your financial details, personal information, and online activity safe from threats with IP Vanish. Get started with this limited time offer and save 83% on our two-year subscription. Visit ipvanish.com slash the next level. That's ipvanish.com slash the next level. Tim, yeah. Newsmax. So I just think it's worth talking about the Newsmax thing for a second because it's still on DirecTV and Comcast, still on our cable providers, speaking about platforming. Mm. The, the, this this network that, that based its entire growth around being uh, totally unapologetic and advancing Donald Trump's lie that the election was stolen and, and helping him in every way possible to attempt a coup and overthrow to throw our democracy and, and doing that under the auspices of news. And um, um, I noticed last night that Corey Lewandowski was, was now a guest host on the network. Um, uh, for those that don't remember my, my masterpiece about Corey Lewandowski's um, uh, arrest in, uh, in Las Vegas, I, I do want to just give you the summary of what happened to Corey Lewandowski a couple years ago. While drunkenly assaulting a married woman at an addiction awareness fundraiser in a private Which is banquet by itself, room. I'm sorry. Amazing. <laughs> it's amazing that it wasn't at like an, a fundraiser for MS or for cancer or anything like that. But it was addiction awareness. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, ahead. and it was at a it, no, that's okay. At the private banquet room at the Las Vegas Benihana, Trump campaign manager Corey Lewandowski allegedly boasted that he had stabbed multiple people to death. So we don't know whether he actually stabbed multiple people to death or whether that's like one his pickup artist routine when he meets married women. Um, but I think it's a uh, metaphor. That was yeah. <laughs> people, that was, women, women who he has slept with have died of shame. <laughs> um, uh, and so he's on Newsmax now. Ed Henry, another news item yesterday. Um, uh, uh, he, he, Ed Henry was fired from Fox for assaulting women. 
Um, a report came out that he was at Real America's Voice yesterday, and a young woman uh, said that he repeatedly texted her things like, suck on D's dick. Um, hmm. Now, D's nuts is the phrase he's referencing there, and that's that's a kind of a slang for these nuts. Hmm. So I don't, it doesn't really work on D's dick, <laughs> D's dick. It's a plural singular <laughs> thing, but anyway. Um, he also sent her uh, several pictures of himself with a stripper, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he left then Real America's Voice and was hired by Newsmax. Um, and like, I just think that again, we, we like to talk about asymmetries. Like, there is no left wing example of this, right? There's not a left wing cable news sh- channel that people can flip to when they're in air, you know, when they're at hotel rooms or when they're, you know, if they're an old person at their house and they're going through the news section and they're going from Fox and they go over to Newsmax, like. Like people can just flip through their cable dial and get Newsmax, and it is a safe landing space for people with a long track record of sexual assault who are unapologetic liars for a demagogue that wants to end our democracy, who don't even attempt to try to do real news. I mean, see what you want about Fox? Like, they don't even have, like, reporters. There's not even, you know, Fox has, like, four people who do real news. Like, they don't even have that at Newsmax. And, and like there isn't, you know, it's not like Bob Menendez when he gets kicked out or Jamal Bowman is going to land on, you know, some channel 822 and it's like an entire network full of disgraced former Democrats. Like that's not a thing that exists. And yet it exists in the Republican world, gets pretty decent ratings and like nobody talks about it. Well, why I wanted to bring it up is nobody talks about it. It's like, oh, that's just – that's just the crazy. That's just the kind of silly stuff over there. That they're on. That's like cable access TV. It's not a big deal. It's like it is kind of a big deal. It's the people that are voting in these fucking primaries are watching this. Uh, so I gotta, I gotta, I want you to give you some space here, Will. Um, but the last I wrote about this today, today's today's newsletter, which uh, again, ding ding ding, go sign up for. It's very good. Um, in the middle of Corey's interview with Trump on Newsmax last night. As Trump starts talking about how, you know, he got more votes than anyone in 2020, Newsmax puts up a chyron at the bottom of the screen, which reads, please note, Newsmax accepts the 2020 election results as legal and final. Right. (laughs) (laughs) A news network which puts up a disclaimer on screen saying... The thing that we're presenting to you is not true. Of course, that's not what it says. It doesn't say that it's not true. It just says that we accept it. as legal. It's kind right? of like and a wink. Is the, it's Isn't it like a wink? It's a little like, bit like. <laughs> it's because they're facing $2 billion lawsuits from Dominion and Smartmatic, um, which are probably going to go to trial in, in September. And I just this is the thing. There is no liberal version of that. Right. There's there is no world in which you go to where uh, the mainstream media or the left is so untethered from reality that the only way to force them to to acknowledge the truth is to sue them. Right. That that's not. And this is I don't know what the answer is, man. When you move to a world in which all of the the virtues and in soft mechanisms of enforcing societal norms like concepts about duty and honor and shame and responsibility and all those things melt away and so that the only way you have of enforcing like that that you have people have to tell the truth is is lawsuits defamation suits i mean what the fuck it's over anyway right it's what's left you don't come back from that world yeah yeah. Maybe you do. Maybe they all die. Just burns itself out. I don't know, man. I mean, that's a. <laughs> I, I, I don't wish, know. I wish I could give you an upbeat take on this. I can't. Um, and uh, it's my impression. I don't know if you guys see this too. My impression is it's gotten worse. So I have not been usually a view a viewer or reviewer of Newsmax. And I'm honestly, Tim, I'm trying to like. You talked about Real America's Voice. I'm like, wait, where is the lineup? It's like Fox. I thought it was Newsmax, then OAN, then Real America's Voice, but maybe I've got the spectrum Yeah, wrong. no, Real America's Voice seems like it's the craziest on the substance, but possibly, you know, maybe um, a little more judicious when it comes to a sexual assault of HR. their young female employees. They've got a better HR department. 
<laughs> They've got a better HR. Like the news content right. is the craziest, but yeah, the HR so we, is. Maybe. So we got a political spectrum, but then we got this sexual assault, assault thing where Newsmax <laughs> seems to have developed a niche right there, right? Yeah, so that's their market. Niche. That's their market. Come on through, roll on, roll on by. So Newsmax, if you wanna. So these guys, you know, all these networks are kind of crazy, but I, my impression is this has gotten worse. I look at a lot of Fox News stuff, and I, when I say look at. I'm like opening the page of Fox News political videos. What's on? First of all, what I've noticed is fewer and fewer people who actually serve in, in office, fewer, fewer office holders, more of like the in-house, you know, uh, uh, propagandist. Talent. Yeah, the, 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 the entertainers, the propagandists. So, so they're all spouting the party line and there's no accountability. There's no even reality check of serving in office. But what they're saying is... Honestly, guys, it looks just like North Korea or something. It's, uh, it is state media. Everybody's, it, it, you look across the page and it's all Biden border crisis. Biden did this. Biden did that. Trump, you know, hero. Trump, uh, you know, everyone, uh, you know, here's like uh, the umpteenth black voter who's turned against Biden and is voting for Trump. So it's not, there's, there's, it is an absolute echo chamber, and I would argue it is more of an echo chamber than it was before. And I'll leave it to some political scientist to, to verify that with whatever metrics. Well, it's that. obviously you don't need a political scientist. I mean, uh, you know, Shepard Smith's gone. I mean, you just you just see the gradual move. You know, I mean, they had some normal hours on the network, and those hours are being shrunk every year. Yeah. So, so let me give you my really dark theory about all this, which is that as the Republican Party has become less of a governing party clearly can't even pass basic bills to keep the government functioning. It has become much, much better at grievance, at manipulating resentments. And that so it's built a very successful internal entertainment industry, the, the sort of Fox News cinematic universe, which we're now saying, you know, Newsmax and OAN and these others are a part of. But it's so it's having tremendous commercial success. Um, and it's not there isn't a, a disincentive built in there. They aren't paying consequences for abandoning governing. That's, that's my main concern. And what that's going to do to governing itself is the next step. It's a big question. And our last sponsor today might help you deal with the stress of thinking about this. Uh, it's One Skin. If you have sensitive skin, you know how hard it can be to find a product that doesn't cause irritation. But today's sponsor, One Skin, makes it easy. Their topical supplements are formulated with soothing ingredients and natural antioxidants. Plus, they're gentle enough to use every day, even if you have sensitive skin. Founded by an all-woman team of scientists, One Skin's products are backed by extensive lab and clinical data to validate their efficacy and safety on all skin types. Not only that, they're the first and only skin longevity company to target cellular senescence, a key hallmark of aging. Their topical supplements are the easiest way to keep your skin healthy and hydrated without the harsh ingredients or irritation often found in other skincare products. And for a limited time, you can try One Skin for 15% off using the code The Next Level when you check out at oneskin.co. I've been using One Skin ever since they started sending me the eye cream, the facial topical facial moisturizer. And I got to tell you, anytime, anytime a straight asks me, why are the gays looking so much more handsome? <laughs> why are they looking so much more handsome in their 40s than straight men? I don't understand it. I'm like, moisturizer, skin moisturizer. Simple as that. One problem. It takes eight seconds in the morning after you get out of the shower. One Skin is the one I've been using, and it's working great. Uh, One Skin is the fir world's first skin longevity company. By focusing on the cellular aspects of aging, they keep your skin looking and acting younger for longer. Get started today with 15% off using the code THENEXTLEVEL at oneskin.co. That's 15% off oneskin.co with the code THENEXTLEVEL. After your purchase, they'll ask where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you. Senescence. I had to practice That's that good. word. Senescence. Do you, you might know about that. You went to medical school. What is senescence? Very good. Very good. Uh, final topic. Washington Post poll out today. You don't know. I don't think you don't know what a senescence is. Key, I've forgotten. <laughs> Get it. Um, key, key uh, swing state that was good. voters. That was good, Will. Key swing state voters uh, asked by the Washington Post, which candidate do you think would do a better job handling threats to democracy in the United States among key state voters? Joe Biden, 33 percent. Donald Trump, 44 percent. So the guy who attempted the coup has a double digit lead on the question of who could handle threats to democracy in the United States. 
At which point, like, I'm just going to go put my head in an oven. <laughs> like, I don't even know what to say about that. I, I, you know what? I, I, just really quick, because I had Stuart Stevens on the Daily today, and he's just unbelievable. I could just listen to that guy spin a yarn for Love hours. That, dude. But um, such a good man. Love uh, you, Stu. But, uh, uh, we love you, but he, he he made an interesting point about the, about this, uh, and he was like, "Look, man, everybody in the MAGA portion of this vote vote. So you know, whatever Trump got in the primary, sixty percent or whatever. Um, like the sixty percent of the Republican vote just tells you whatever the opposite of reality is, no matter what. And so, like you, you really got to drill down on what percentage of people who are." you know, pr- potentially in the land of the, the persuadable and the sane and the reality. Like, could you, could you get with this? And the, the number gets a little smaller. Does that make you feel any better? When you, when you drill down to just what the post calls deciders. So oh, the, the swing state voters, it's true. It's true that Trump's lead on this question, which is again, who can best protect democracy inside the United States is only nine points. <laughs> so he's down to single digits. Can, well, can, all right. Well, I tried. That was the best I got. Well, Will, I'd like to shoot turn. your pony in the head. Go for it. <laughs> okay. Here, here's the pony. It, it, it depends on which way you want to read this contradiction among these voters. So these deciders, this constituency that they think will decide the election. I don't know if their analysis is right. More than seven in 10 believe that Trump will not accept the results of the election if he loses, compared with only one third who say the same about Biden. Again, of these deciders, nearly half, 47 percent, say Trump would try to rule as a dictator if he is elected. So they're, they're agreeing. They're, they're agreeing with us about this. Only 15 percent say Biden would do that. The poll finds that just over half of these deciders think Trump is guilty of criminal charges of lying about vote fraud in an attempt. to. Again, that's not the New York case. That's, that's lying about the, 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 the Jack Smith case about the 2020 election. And then and then at the same time, we've got these numbers that JVL is citing. So. There is at least agreement on some basic facts about Trump's danger, which maybe we can work with. The other way to look at it, of course, the JVL way would be, and yet they don't care. And I got to read one quote from this story. This is this belongs in a JVL newsletter if it isn't already. I'm ready. Alex Mayer, 25, a manufacturing process engineer who lives in Grand Blanc, Michigan, and says he is likely to support Trump, is among those who believe democracy will stand no matter who is president. Quote, I find it very hard to believe that democracy is going to go away. I don't think about it very much. I look at it as a foundation that will never change. That's what we're up against. There's a Tim Miller. Was it this article or a different article? There's a Tim Miller in Wisconsin that was voted in one of these double hater articles. And he also is leaning towards Trump. I I tried to pull it up real quick. I can't find it. Uh, um, And I, I feel like if anybody knows the Tim Miller in Wisconsin that was quoted in the New York Times, I'm looking for his phone number because I just want to I like I want to call one Tim Miller to another and be like, bruh. Right. You, your life seems like it's good. You know, he was he was a little he's a little he thinks that Trump will be better for the economy, I think, was his line. I was like, all right. Look, like, I, I, I feel like I can win him over one Tim Miller at a time. You know, eight years ago, I would have said the same thing as this this dude from Michigan. I would have said, yeah, no, democracy is like point, it's not going to. The thing is that in the between, we did have an attempted coup. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, I, that posi- the point is like that was a reasonable position to hold eight years ago. And honestly, was even a reasonable position to hold four years ago. Right. Going into the 2020 election, you could have said, yeah, the I mean, Trump's done bad stuff, but like we haven't hit Orbanism. Right. There is no attempt to systematically disassemble democratic institutions. Um, and then we had his attempted coup followed by his openly talking about using the pardon power to get people to do criminal actions on his behalf in a second term. And uh, transform the federal workforce into political loyalists instead of civil service bureaucrats and say out loud that he would like to be a dictator. You know, like, I just feel like there have been some facts which have happened. Yeah, I mean, he was king. Not kidding. I mean, unless he wanted to be kidding, but then he's not kidding. (laughs) You know, isn't the lesson of these numbers (laughs) Okay, the, the, the seven and 10 say Trump won't accept. They're, these are all about what they believe Trump will do or will try to do. We'll try to govern as a dicta- rule as a dictator, will refuse to accept the election, but the system will hold. Isn't that the lesson? These people believe the guardrails, that there are guardrails, which are not them, which will hold. So we got to scare them. Will, we got to scare them more. That's I am the answer. Sorry, will, I got to. 
To believe in guardrails requires such an expansive knowledge and understanding of government that these people have absolutely no concept of that. They just think that, like, it'll all be okay, man. You are ascribing far too much reason. You're like, well, actually, they take a very, a very, uh, uh, Madisonian view of the system of government that we have. And they understand the inherent state. checks and balances. No, no, that's not. It's not like they're so sophisticated that they they believe that this intricate system and, and this thing over here will hold and the that unitary thing over here. president theory. You know, they're they're this just is, these are just like there's a lot of merit to just that. no information voters who are just like yeah it'll be fine I guess whatever man I gotta go look at my iPhone go Packers guys good show medium length show. Great show, I think. <laughs> Will, thanks for really sitting good in. Show. You're going to be live. We're going to be live. I might pop in, but you're going to be live tomorrow night during the debate. Yes. So people should sign up for that. Yeah. Uh, if you Zoom, want to come hang out get with on us, the email Bullet list, Plus we'll members send you the get a full debate night package. We're going to do a pre-show watch party during the show where people can chit-chat with each other, which our members love to do. And then after the show, instant hot take analysis with me and A.B. Stoddard and Bill Crystal who will explain how we can finally, at the convention, get Gina Raimondo in as a Democratic <laughs> nominee. <laughs> Bill, I'm kidding because I love you. Bye, guys. <laughs>